Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this edition of a digital event series brought to you by the International Society of Terrain Vehicle Systems. My name is Kalk Els. I am the leader of the Vehicle Dynamics Group at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. I'm also the Deputy General Secretary of IASTVS for the Europe Africa region and also one of the editors of the Journal of Terra Mechanics. Uh, I would like to introduce our speaker this afternoon, um, my colleague, Dr. Herman Hamersma, uh, to you. Uh, Herman will talk to you about the work he's been doing for the last five years or so in terms of uh, off-road vehicle collision management systems and driver assist systems, especially applicable to the South African mining industry. Uh, I've known Armand for 15 years. He started off as one of my undergraduate students and continued through a master's degree and a PhD. Uh, so I really trust that you will enjoy uh, his talk. After the talk, there will be uh, time for questions. Uh, if you have any questions for Armand, so please write that down and, and uh, have him ready when the discussion starts. So Armand, Welcome, thank you uh, for joining us, and over to you. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Professor Skalk, uh, and thank you to the Society for inviting me to this uh, uh, terabyte talk. Um, I've attended quite a few ISDVS conferences in the past decade or so, and uh, it's always interesting to see uh, the focus is often on, on agricultural machines and military vehicles and so on, and, and yet we seldom see mining machines um, and, and concepts of mining machines and their uh, things that are very relevant to the ISDVS society um, uh, presented there. So um, I hope you enjoy today's presentation and uh, I just want to share my screen um, and then I will begin. Let's just see. I just want to confirm that you can see my screen in presentation mode. mode. Okay. Excellent, I see all the thumbs up. Um, okay, so without further ado, um, as Professor Skalk has uh, said, my topic today is off-road advanced driver assist systems in the South African mining industry. Um, so I want to start off with a brief history of mining in South Africa. Um, and it's to just to emphasize that we have a very rich history of mining, prospecting and mineral beneficiation. Uh, diamonds were first discovered in 1867 uh, and the city or town nowadays of Kimberley was founded in 1873. Uh, the largest rough diamond ever found in the world was found in Cullinan, which is just a few uh, kilometers away from Pretoria where I am at the moment. Um, it uncut, it weighed 3,106 carats or 621 grams. Um, this was found in 1905. Uh, it was cut into 105 stones uh, and then the largest are actually in the United Kingdom's crown jewels which we saw on display uh, recently. The Cullinan one diamond is 530 carats and it's currently in the sovereign scepter with cross you can see there in the bottom right. Gold was also discovered here in 1852. Um, this led to the gold rush at the Tvarte Ferrand um, which culminated in the establishment of Johannesburg, which is one of the largest cities on the African continent. Um, as a result, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange was also established in 1887. And you can see a Kruger Rand of one fine ounce of gold, uh, 24 karat gold there on the right hand side. Um, to give you an overview of what is actually mined, uh, South Africa is the world's largest producer of chrome, manganese, platinum and vanadium. Um, there are other noteworthy resources um, that include gold, titanium, palladium, zirconium, uranium, iron ore, and coal. And you can see on the map of South Africa there on your right hand side, um, it's mainly focused around Johannesburg here in the Gauteng area, but then there are other more remote sites, uh, some even towards Cape Town side down at the bottom left. Yeah. Give you an overview of the industry. Um, the mining industry contributes 7.5% to the South African GDP. Um, this is roughly 490 billion Rand in 2022, which is approximately $30 billion. Um, 475,000 people are directly employed in mining in South Africa, and each person has up to nine indirect dependents. Um, so 
the mining industry effectively supports around 4 million people in this country. Um, the six deepest mines in the world are located in South Africa. Um, Hempuneng gold mine is the deepest, that's four kilometers underground. Tartona gold mine is 3.9 kilometers and Savuka gold mine is 3.7 kilometers underground. We also have some of the largest open pit mines. Uh, a notable one is the Session iron ore mine, which produces around 30 million metric tons of iron ore per year. And the Mkholakwena platinum mine, which produces 310,000 ounces of platinum per year. Uh, these are extremely big mines uh, with massive fleets of very large machines. To give you an idea of the technology that we uh, we see being used, um, the very deep mines really make for very, very challenging conditions. So we have extreme temperatures. Some of these mines have rock faces that exceed 60 degrees Celsius. Um, so you need proper ventilation. Some of the big mines pump ice slurry down uh, to cool the air. You have extremely high levels of humidity because you are beneath the water table. So um, it's not only very hot, it is extremely humid. And then, of course, you have very confined spaces because the more material you have to remove, the lower your profit. So we see stopping width uh, with as little as 0 0.9 to 1.2 meters. And you can see an example of that in the image on the top right. Um, these very, very dangerous and hazardous working conditions result in a relatively poor safety record, um, unfortunately. So um, in an effort to protect the workers, more and more mines are mechanizing, um, moving away from conventional mining where you still have a manual uh, drill and so on and trying to get as much machines involved as possible. So you can remove as many people as you can from the hazardous environment. We have approximately 2,000 loss of time injuries reported annually um, and fatalities have definitely reduced from 270 in 2003, which is terrible, down to 49 fatalities reported in 2022. Um, this is a trend that has kept on decreasing and we hope it continues in that direction through applying more and more technology to the problem. Transport and machinery, um, so they divide these uh, fatalities into different categories and transport and machinery, which we are mainly concerned with, uh, consistently ranks as the second leading cause after falls of ground. So falls of ground is when the when the tunnel will physically cave in um, and someone is trapped underneath. When we move to surface mining applications, it's quite the opposite. Um, so we have very, very large machines, as you can see there on the right hand side. Um, so a typical example at Session Mine is a machine with an engine of 16 cylinders with a 2000 kilowatt engine, a top speed of almost 65 kilometers an hour. It has 5380 R63 tires that weigh 26,000 kilograms each, and you have six of these tires on each truck. It has a nominal payload of 290 metric tons um, and a nominal GVW of 521 metric tons. This is absolutely massive. Um, the first hydrogen powered haul truck is actually uh, operating at the Mukhala Quena platinum mine um, and it has a 1.2 megawatt hour lithium ion battery. So really some unique technology um, being uh, used in the South African mining industry. To give you an overview of where we are now, um, the mines are adopting technology to improve safety. Uh, as is evident, we want to remove those workers from those hazardous environments. But we also want to improve production. So mining deeper, mining faster, mining cheaper, mining cleaner. Um, all of these are, are some of the, the goals of using technology um, and trying to remove as little material as possible so that you, you can have as much profit as well. Specific here in South Africa, we have new regulations uh, that were recently promulgated in December of 2022. And Summarized, these regulations require automatic emergency braking uh, for both surface and underground mines. Um, there are specific requirements, um, but summed up, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle, uh, AEB is required for surface mines and vehicle-to-pedestrian is required for underground mines. This is based mainly on the, the type of incidents that we have in the two two types of mining, um, where on surface mines, uh, it is unlikely that you will have vehicle to pedestrian interaction and underground, um, the, the interaction is more vehicle to pedestrian. Uh, 
Um, as far as I know, South Africa is the only region that is actually mandating the use of technology definitely to the extent that we are uh, to prevent these collisions. So if we move more towards how the technology actually works, uh, it's the same as any other autonomous type system. So we can typically divide this into four key um, objectives. The first is to sense. We need to collect data of the real world. We need to uh, perform measurements. Um, we then need to perceive. So we need to interpret this data that we are measuring um, to better understand the, the physical world in which we find ourselves. When you have this information, you need to plan. So that will typically mean you need to find a path. You need to figure out what to do. And then finally, you need to act. So you need to follow your path. You need to implement the plan that you, that you have made. So if I look at these four phases, the first is I'm sensing. So the question I'm asking is, where am I and what am I doing? So we typically see the sensing as uh, the aim has is twofold. So the first is situational awareness. And the second is self-awareness. Situational awareness is concerned with localization. So I typically want to answer the question, where am I? And where are the other objects relative to me? From the mining perspective, this is typically more challenging underground. Um, because underground, we have limited line of sight. We are in a tunnel. Um, we have no satellite coverage. Um, and the products that we see in the market are typically reliant on RF time of flight technologies using ultra wideband or other frequencies. Um, but, but these are the typical sensors that we see suppliers uh, using underground. On the other hand, self-awareness is closely related to the vehicle dynamics. So it answers, or well, you ask the question, what am, what am I doing? And here, typical sensors will include a ground speed sensor, something to determine how fast I'm going, which gear I'm in, what the engine speed is so that I can uh, possibly apply a retarder to slow me down. I can even measure the pressure in my brake lines to see how much I am braking. And very important is actually knowing what the payload of the machine is, uh, because this will obviously affect the stopping distance quite a lot. The next step is to perceive. So now we need to interpret the sensor data. So for situational awareness, this means I need to recognize and classify different objects. Um, I need to track objects that are in close proximity to me. And I also want to understand what the ego, ego vehicle's current mission is. So for example, am I driving from the coal face to the, to the conveyor belt or the crusher, or am I returning backward, back to the, uh, to the shovel or the loading area? Um, if I have this knowledge, I can also prioritize the, the plan that I make to avoid a collision. From a self-awareness perspective, um, I need to understand the effect of the ego vehicle's current state on my vehicle dynamics. So as I mentioned earlier, the payload, but then also the gradient and the friction of the road surface, they will all have a significant impact on the stopping distance. Um, it's also important to note that the very large machines are, are highly prone to rollover. Um, on some of these machines uh, at full steering lock, they will roll over at speeds as low as 20 kilometers an hour. And that is without the payload. Um, the third step is to plan. So I need to plan a feasible course of action. So my previous steps determined where I am, what I'm doing, and what my mission is. And now I need to figure out where am I going and is there anything in my way? If there is something in my way, I need to plan this course of action. Um, and unique here in South Africa with our regulations, we specifically require that the operator first be warned. Um, and if there's a pedestrian involved in the underground scenario, you need to, to warn the, op the pedestrian as well. Um, and then if the operator does not intervene appropriately, um, they must, uh, the machine must automatically slow and stop. This is typically more challenging on surface mines um, because we have more machines in, in a close proximity, the speeds are higher. So my sensing uh, range is much larger. So I, I typically detect more uh, objects within my detection range. Um, and I, it, it's a more difficult decision to make uh, because of the high speeds and the very, very long stopping distances. I, uh, I need to plan very far ahead and then act uh, much sooner than you would typically be the case in a, in a, a pedestrian vehicle or a road going vehicle. Um, these big mining machines will typically decelerate at the maximum deceleration of 0.3 G. 
Um, but if they are fully laden and going downhill, it might be even worse than that. Um, we have measured much lower than that in certain uh, instances. The final phase is to act. So now we need to implement this plan that I made. So, of course, we need to warn the operator and that he must or she must start braking. This is the effective warning. Um, and the regulations specifically require that the warning must be, must be effective. Um, this means we have human-machine interaction. Um, and the result of such a warning should be the outcome of a human-centered design process. Um, uh, having been in many of these mining machines, um, one of my uh, pet peeves is that you have so many buzzes and warnings and things shouting at you in the, in the cab that you don't know what you need to pay attention to and it becomes a sensory overload. Um, what you should be doing is to give the operator a very clear and concise instruction with sufficient time to react. We do assume that the operator is paying attention. He might just be distracted, um, but it's not uh, an autonomous vehicle where the operator is doing his morning Sudoku or crossword puzzle. Um, he or she is actively driving or operating the machine. So uh, at least that reduces the reaction time compared to uh, a fully autonomous vehicle uh, that may then ask the, the driver to intervene. If the operator does not intervene, um, the regulations require that the machine must slow and stop safely, which means no sliding, no loss of control, no locking of wheels, etc. Um, it's also important to note that very large machines typically cannot apply friction brakes from speeds uh, above 10 kilometers an hour repeatedly. Um, just to give you an example, if you have that truck that I showed you earlier that weighs 520 tons, driving at 10 kilometers an hour, the kinetic energy that you need to dissipate is two megajoules. Um, so if you have to repeatedly put all of that through the friction brake system, you will be melting brakes and, and, and the machine will be down for repair more often than not. So typical strategies involve applying retarders and so on and slowing the machine down gradually until you reach a safe braking speed uh, after which you can then apply the friction brakes. There are several factors that affect the performance of these systems. So if I look at the four phases for the sense and perceive, it's the challenging environment, the limited line of sight that we have in, in underground mines, even on some of the surface mines where you have large berms or possibly even some vegetation, um, you have limited line of sight. The congested environment makes for very difficult sensing. Um, the propagation of radio frequency, um, of radio signals underground through a tunnel uh, is hampered significantly if you have an object in the tunnel. Um, and the other challenge, I think, is we uh, a lot of the existing off-the-shelf solutions are based on automotive applications where the environment is vastly different. So typical sensors such as automotive radar and, um, and, and so on are, are ill-suited for typically underground mining applications. Um, the friction coefficient is also very important, as you can imagine, and this is obviously very difficult to measure or to estimate, and yet it is extremely important. And I'll show you some some photos of uh, conditions that we have encountered in our travels around the country at the different mines. If I look at the plan and act phases, um, the big challenge is that these machines are so slow to respond. Um, they, first of all, take long to start braking once you tell them to, and then the deceleration is very slow, meaning you need to plan very far ahead, as I mentioned earlier. Another big challenge we are seeing is that the South African machines are very, very old. Um, this, this may possibly due to, be due to our, uh, the challenging exchange rate of importing uh, machines from other parts in the world, um, which means that the machines are replaced very, very rarely. Um, and, and these machines are, are, are not very intelligent, and you need to retrofit intelligence to these machines. Many of them are still purely mechanical, where you have no electronic sensors on board. You don't have a canvas. Uh, it, it, still is a manual valve system that you need to modify then so you can perform brake by wire, etc. The other uh, thing that we are seeing is that suppliers are obviously erring on the side of caution. Um, they would rather stop excessively than miss uh, a detection or miss an incident, um, which would then lead possibly to uh, an incident and a resulting fatality or injury. So. Because they are erring on the side of caution, we see excessive false positives leading to excessive wear on the machine's uh, brake, 
breaks and other aspects. Um, we see a loss of production. And as I mentioned earlier, this operator alarm fatigue, where you start ignoring the alarm because it just keeps on going off all the time. I want to show you some, some uh, photos of, of the road conditions. I think this is highly relevant to the ISDVA society. So here's an example of, of the road conditions. And what we see here is we have a pedestrian dummy, um, and there is a mining machine approaching from the left. And you can see that this machine will actually be breaking uh, in this wet patch where it is uneven and um, and extremely muddy. So uh, what the whether the, the deceleration will actually be as the, the supplier anticipates is unknown uh, at this stage. Another example here, uh, this is at a platinum mine, um, and you can see all of these loose uh, gravel and, and smaller stones, etc., um, on the road surface. Um, this is, at, at the moment, this is very dry, so as you're driving along, it's just a big cloud of dust. Um, this may also affect your visual-based senses um, and so on. So this is a typical example uh, on, on a surface mine. This is on this exact same mine, and you can actually see on the haul road on the right-hand side, the water bowser has been passed, and there's a definite darker shade of gray on the right-hand side. So it means that the road is wet on the one side of the road, but it's bone dry on the other side. So the water bowser has actually been up the, up the hill. It's probably turning around somewhere and will be coming down uh, eventually. Um, so the road surface condition will change consistently throughout the day as the water bowser suppresses the dust. And then this is in the Rustenburg area. So we, in the summer, typically expect temperatures above 35 degrees Celsius. So the water evaporates and it becomes bone dry again. So accounting for where the water bowser is, uh, is one example of um, like taking the friction and change in friction condition, uh, friction coefficient into account. Another example here is where we actually were testing um, with two machines, and you can see that the colors of the road surface here are quite different, and that's because this is right next to a stockpile. Um, so there's a lot of gravel um, from the stockpile. So here, that's the white on the, on the image. You also see a, a wet area here on the right-hand side, and you see a clear case of rutting forming um, as we are maneuvering and driving around here. Um, this means that you, you will have varying friction coefficients all over the place. Um, I think my final example of different road conditions, this is at a, a surface coal mine. And if you look closely, you can actually see the, uh, the tracks moving into these puddles um, uh, and so on. And there's, so it goes from bone dry dust uh, to 100% to saturation uh, in a very close area. My final example here is if we look at this truck, you can see that there is almost no tread left. The air state uh, will change as well. Um, and, and this is one of the challenges that the suppliers of these products have to address is that they need to account for different wear states and different braking performance. And this will vary from each machine to each machine depending on its condition. Next up, I want to discuss our role in the industry and, and, and what we've been doing. We've been involved in this for at least the last seven or eight years. Um, and we are currently funded by the Minerals Council of South Africa. Um, and the first project that we, we did for them uh, together with some other suppliers was to apply a systems engineering approach to, to the collision prevention system conundrum. Um, in the past, there were no clear guidelines. There are no ISO standards, at least not, um, uh, well, when we got involved, there were no ISO standards relating to this. So um, it was a bit of a myriad and a, of solutions and problems, and nobody really knew where to start and, and what to do. So the first step was then to go back to the basics of applying systems engineering, um, defining user requirements, using those user requirements to define functional and technical performance requirements, and along with that, clear and consistent quantifiable acceptance criteria. Um, along with the acceptance criteria is a standardized test specification. And the aim of this is to provide guidance to the industry 
in how these systems should perform and then how you can confirm that they actually do what they are supposed to do. Subsequent to that, we are currently in the process of developing a test capability to execute all of the tests um, defined in the test specification. We are also focusing our research on collision prevention system shortcomings um, with our main contribution at the moment focusing on planning and acting those two phases. Um, that's really where we are, are focusing our effort because that's more on the vehicle dynamics side of, uh, of things. So to give you an overview of the test instruments that we have recently procured through funding from the Minerals Council, we have uh, on the left, you see a VBOX 3i, that's an RTK high precision GPS system. We have four of these kits uh, in our lab at the moment. On the right is a race logic uh, VBOX, but it's a standard precision, it's just a Sigma. We have several of these as well. Um, this, is, this allows us to test complex multiple interactor scenarios um, uh, as you would typically encounter on a surface mine. If we move to underground testing, uh, on the left, we have an, uh, an indoor positioning system also from RaceLogic. Uh, it also uses the ultra wideband um, uh, sensing or ultra wideband uh, radios. Um, this is limited to line of sight, um, but it is sufficient for testing um, in, in underground applications where we do not have uh, satellite coverage. Um, these, however, only give us uh, the, the range or the position. Um, so to measure the ground speed, we have ground speed sensors uh, that make use of light, uh, radar technology to measure the ground speed directly. Um, so this is for our underground uh, test, um, the underground test that we have to do. We then also have several brake robots as these are actuators shown here on the right. So we can actually uh, install these brake robots on eight uh, light vehicles to test the, uh, the systems before we start testing on a mine. And we've recently acquired a drone to film all of the, um, all of the tests that we do to improve our communication with the wider industry. To explain our test approach, uh, it's based on the NASA TRL levels, moving from TRL 1, which is the basic principles, all the way through to TRL 9, which is successful mission operation. And we can broadly divide these into three phases where you have development testing at the lower TRL levels, moving to verification testing from TRL 4 through to TRL 7. This is typically in a controlled environment, such as a proving ground or in our laboratory. And then at TRL 8 and TRL 9, we move to validation testing where we are confirming the results we saw at the verification stage in the operational environment. Um, and, and following this approach uh, allows us to, to do safe tests to start off with. Um, it, it is quite dangerous to test with real mining machines uh, for the first time. So we want to make sure we've ticked all the boxes and all the I's have been dotted and T's have been crossed uh, before we start testing with heavy machines where we have a very small room uh, for error. Um, so to give you an example, here is one of our test vehicles that's been instrumented with uh, an underground system. We also have our pedestrian dummy you saw on the earlier photo, um, typically with a tag in his pocket. You can see here uh, in his pocket. So this will typically be used uh, at the TRL4 stage test. Uh, our Land Rover there on the left has been instrumented with a brake robot. Um, we have a DSpace micro auto box install, installed that we use as a data, data acquisitioning system and as a, a control system. Um, and we use that to control our brake robot. So here you see a video of the brake robot in action where it is physically pulling the brake of the machine. So we make these vehicles available to the industry. Uh, to come and test and then we follow the standardized test specification to evaluate the products against the acceptance criteria that have been formulated. And then here is an example of a test that we've done um, at the proving ground. So we have the pedestrian here on the left, the test vehicle will be approaching and turning towards the pedestrian um, to see if the system will actually slow and stop the machine. As you can see, this was not a successful test, which um, 
<laughs> serves as good motivation to do these tests in a proving ground. Um, this is for an underground system, and you can see that these are absolutely perfect conditions. We have clear blue skies, we have a hard packed uh, 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 test surface with a high friction coefficient, we have perfect line of sight, and yet the system was not able to detect the pedestrian. Uh, and, and we do not want to do that test uh, with <laughs> a live, a real human being. We then also can do tests with um, with real mining machines. So here's an example of a 40-ton truck. Um, it's also at a proving ground uh, approaching a pedestrian. Um, and you can just see the amount of space you need to get the machine up to speed. So this test, I think, was done at 30 kilometers an hour, 3-0, but you need at least 400 meters to get the machine up to speed and then slow it down to a stop again. So you should see the pedestrian in the top of your screen at the moment. Um, you will see a puff of smoke from the machine when it starts slowing down. This machine was slowed down by applying the retarder and eventually it comes to a stop and the gap there was approximately 15 meters um, if I have to hazard a guess. Here's my final video where we are actually doing a head-on collision test between two trucks that weigh 400 tons each. Um, obviously, this takes some courage in doing. This is my own video I filmed while sitting inside the cab. Um, fortunately, because I'm talking to you today, you can know that the test was successful. But before you are in a position to conduct a test such as this, it is really important to very, very meticulously and rigorously test these systems um, so that you can ensure the safety of everybody involved. To finish off, um, I think it's, it's clear that we are faced with unique and challenging regulations here in South Africa. Um, and advanced driver assist system technology is being developed specifically for mining applications, which is a unique uh, application here in South Africa. We have very challenging environments, both for sensing and for control, and, and understanding the tire terrain interaction and the effect that that has on the vehicle dynamics, and in this case specifically on the braking distance, has never been more important. Um, as the vehicle dynamics group uh, here at the University of Pretoria, we are heavily involved in this. Um, we are actively researching the tire terrain interaction. Uh, I'm sure you've seen some of the work by my colleague, Dr. Carl Becker. Um, we are also developing our own control systems for autonomous emergency braking in mining. Um, we are testing and evaluating commercial products with our tailor-made test instruments. And we are advising industry leaders on the technical aspects um, pertaining to collision prevention systems in the mining industry. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I look forward to any questions and any, uh, any engagement. Um, so please don't hesitate to, to contact me should you have any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Herman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is open for questions. If you have a question for Herman, please unmute yourself uh, and we will try and ask you, answer your question as well as we can. So while you are thinking of questions, I have a few um, questions for Herman. The first question is, this, is, this digital event series is brought to you by the International Society for Terrain Vehicle Systems. So Herman, if you want to give the society a challenge, uh, which is in line with their mission, what, what would this challenge be? Prof Kalk, I think that's a good question. Um, I, I think the Understanding the, the tire terrain interaction, especially with these extremely large tires um, and, and very, very large machines um, is, is very important. The other interesting tires. Um, so it, it is a rubber tire, but then it's, it's, it's almost rigid. So, and, and these tires are very large, um, uh, but the machines travel at very slow speeds. So, Sometimes you might even have the, um, the machines come to a complete stop uh, without a full revolution of the wheel, um, which if you 
recall typical vehicle dynamics uh, fundamentals, you, you typically expect the full braking force to be developed when you have completed one full revolution. So understanding the, the tire terrain interaction and, and better understanding the, the factors that affect this um, could be very beneficial. Um, we may see differences not only uh, between surface and underground, but between different commodity types as well. So your typical platinum mine might have a completely different friction coefficient from a typical coal mine. Um, so if we if we could pro probably get a database or uh, of that, that would be the first step. But if we could develop um, real-time online friction estimation uh, or, or something like that, to, uh, that would be very, very beneficial, provide a lot of information to the suppliers and developers of these products. So that is a challenge, I think, <laughs> uh, qu quite a big challenge for, for, for the society to address. Thank you. So audience, please, questions from your side. We are awaiting your questions. So as you might know, I'm a lecturer. I've been at the university for 25 years. So if the students don't ask questions, then I start asking questions to the students. So, so please uh, send us your questions or uh, so that we can try and discuss them. Nick, I see you are speaking, but we can't hear you. Uh, maybe it's just me, but uh, maybe and try, try to unmute your mic. Try again. Can yes, you? that's good. Thank you. We can hear yeah. you. Uh, good afternoon, Prof. Skalk. Good afternoon, Herman. Um, Prof. Skalk, I was going to say, I, th I thought you'd sort of pick on your students as opposed to <laughs> sort of volunteering a question on their behalf. Um, but anyway, Herman, thank you very much. Um, I, I think just um, first question is, um, Obviously, some of your videos and pictures there was Jurotech, um, and I've been with you at Jurotech, you know, running some tests. Um, and you you did ask, almost answered my, my question with your last picture, or the last test there, where you had a, um, where you're doing on-site on -site testing. Have, have you got to a stage now where you are doing, I suppose, more on-site testing than you, than, you, than you are doing at Jurotech? And then my second question is, um, one of the examples you showed um, was the Land Rover turning into the into the dummy. Obviously, that's a very complex scenario. Um, how 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 do you think the, the the systems have matured to handle these these more these more demanding and complex scenarios? Thank you. Hi, Nick. Yes, uh, I think uh, good questions. Um, your first one on testing a Geritec and then. Uh, moving more to the higher levels of, of testing, um, we are definitely getting more requests for testing at the at the higher TRL levels on site. Um, I think what is very important is that before you move to on-site testing, you need to be really sure that the system um, has been properly vetted uh, at the lower levels. And unfortunately, due to the, the pressure the industry is faced with, um, by the regulator um, demanding them to to implement systems that are possibly not completely ready, they they want to jump the uh, jump the gun and start testing on site. And um, we actually had a very close call with with an incident with a test the other day uh, on one of these sites uh, with one of these tests, where the the supplier and the mine and so on they were all willing to take a shortcut um, and, and take a few risks. So unfortunately, you know, that, that's a very, very big exercise to get everybody on the mine, pull machines out of production. Um, I can't imagine what all of that cost just in terms of opportunity cost. And in the end, the recommendation was, let's go back to Jurotech and do the basic test because the, the supplier had tested four or five years ago, um, but obviously it subsequently continued developing their product um, and, and the, the version of the product that we tested on the day had had not been vetted at the at the lab scale TRL four level properly. So um, we we can move towards on-site testing, but we should not 
um, miss the important verification steps at the at the lower levels. Um, what we are seeing in terms of for your que second question, um, in terms of the intelligence of the uh, of the systems, um, a lot of it is based on uh, on the sensor data that they that they get um, or they are able to do. Um, we've seen some examples where uh, you know something as complex as lidar technology has been used to autonomously move a, a drill rig around. Um, so it's entirely possible to do that. Um, but it comes at an extreme cost. Uh, so the more inf proper information you have, and as sensor technology improves, um, I think the barrier to entry and, and, and the cost involved will become lower and lower, um, and we'll, we will see more mature uh, systems. I, I also think that um, getting more information on what the machine is actually doing, um, having more sensors on board, for example, if you could get steering angle, or articulation angle or something like that, um, that could help with a scenario as I showed earlier where we actually hit the pedestrian. Um, so we have seen some suppliers that actually try and measure uh, the articulation angle of the machine um, and so on. So uh, it's, it's developing very, very quickly. Um, and I think the, the key part of it is really understanding the, the user requirement, what the, what the end user expects these things to do how the end user is actually going to be using the machine um, uh, and then accommodating that. Uh, I think that those are very important things to, to understand. I hope I answered all, all your questions. So thank you, Herman. There are uh, two questions in the chat, uh, one from Alex. He says, how much international interest is there in developing harmonized safety standards for large surface mining machinery? Um, yes, there's definitely uh, interest. Um, and of course, there are some existing standards, uh, especially for uh, brake specifications and so on. I can think of the ISO 3450 standard for, for earth moving equipment for uh, it defines the braking specification. Um, there is a new series of ISO standards, the ISO 21815 series, uh, specifically also looked at, uh, aimed at collision prevention for earth moving machinery. Um, uh, and I think the first two parts of that series uh, have now been published. Um, but this is developing very, very slowly, um, uh, as is the norm for, for standards, just due to the, the, the process that this follows. Um, I always use the example that we are at really at the infant stages of this technology. It's similar to when Henry Ford had built his first automobile, not the Model T Ford even, just the first one that he got up and running in his kitchen uh, in the late 1800s. Um, you know, he was driving around between horse-drawn carts and carriages and so on, um, and there were no brake specifications or, or anything of the sort. It was only later when we had enough uh, vehicles on the road that the National Highway Traffic Safety Board uh, was formed and, and that there were actually brake specifications and safety belts and lights and all of these things uh, installed and required on the from the machine. So um, we, we really are in the beginning of this. Um, I think many of the suppliers that we interact with, they, they feel that they now have a working product. So here we are, here we go. Um, but we're really in the beginning of the technology S curve. So. Um, we don't really know where it's going to end, um, but it's developing very, very quickly. So to stay on top of things is, is, is really challenging at the moment. But uh, as a researcher, that's, that's really a fun environment to, to be in. Um, yes. So we have a question from Robin, uh, and he asks, what state estimation techniques have you used thus far? How effective have they been? Um, yeah, so um, we think we so some of my postgraduate students have um, have been actively working on on some of the control systems. Um, the application of real state estimation in in the classical sense of the the term we we haven't seen that much. Um, I, I specifically recall one interaction with a supplier where he told me that he'd heard of this guy called Kalman. But he's hesitant because it sounds very complicated. <laughs> um, th this was a long time ago, though, so it, it was more a tongue-in-the-cheek remark. Um, 
I think sensor fusion is, is absolutely critical here. Um, if you if you rely on a single uh, measurement or a single type of measurement, you are, are really exposing yourself to um, to to some risk uh, just due to the challenging nature of, of sensing. Uh, even something as simple as, as GPS, uh, you know, it's prone to drop out um, even under perfect conditions. And then when you are uh, operating in, in an open pit where you may even have, have very limited satellite coverage, even on the Earth's surface, just because you are so deep in the pit, um, that, that presents a risk. So key to this is, is properly uh, sensing your environment and, and then relying on sensor fusion to, to combine measurements from different sensors. Um, of course, what you what you would uh, you can just imagine with some of these big trucks, you won't be able to install, for example, a single lidar that gives you a 360 degree view. You will have blind spots. So stitching together multiple uh, sensors or using, for example, multiple cameras positioned around the machine, uh, that, that's really important. And then properly blending or combining these system, these um, sensors um, is really important. Um, from a, and all of that is, is, is a form of, of state estimation. So um, fortunately in the, in the ISO standard, we, um, there is a data message uh, that gets uh, transmitted from the machine to the, to the technology product. Um, and this data message contains many of the things that, that, that you would typically want, such as the speed and gear selection. Um, you can even, if you have it available, transmit the, uh, or communicate the payload. Um, but there are other aspects that I think are missing that are quite important, such as the steering angle uh, and so on. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, we're seeing a plethora of approaches um, and, and the jury is still out on what the best approach is, um, but I, I think it's still out there. Uh, we're still heading towards it. Okay, we have another question from Aslan. Uh, he asks, uh, would a fully autonomous transport system be in consideration for the safety development process? Is this feasible? I hope I understand your question correctly. Um, so it's, it's, I hope it, it, so understanding how, how autonomous mining and so on, um, where that fits in. Um, and we do have examples of autonomous mining machines, typically for the whole cycle, as that's the easier part to, to automate. Um, there are some examples in Australia uh, and elsewhere in the world where they have mines effectively running the whole whole cycle uh, autonomously. Um, so th that is definitely, from a technological point of view, an option. Uh, also, I think it's, it's still in its infant days, but uh, Mining is a process that lends itself to, to full autonomy because it's a very repetitive, monotonous thing. You keep doing the same thing. You pick up the muck, you put it, <laughs> move it somewhere, you put it down and you drive back and you pick it up again. And you keep doing that for hours and hours on end. So um, it's also an environment that, that you can map uh, ahead of time. So you can have uh, a priori information available um, to your system. So you can... It, position yourself in, in the environment quite easily. I think it's it's easier than, than uh, the urban environment that, I mean, it, it changes with every mission profile. Every time you get in your autonomous vehicle, you want to go somewhere else. So um, from that perspective, mining is, is I think, a, a step towards full, full autonomous um, vehicles. I think in South Africa, um, the, the challenge there will be um, you know, if you if you remove the worker from from the mine, um, yes, it's safer, but there will be some unhappiness uh, from our workforce. So th that's a political question uh, that that uh, that needs an answer. But we need to trade very carefully. Um, as with any mention of autonomy, uh, the implication is that the the workforce, what they do, will change. Um, uh, so you will still have a breakdown. You will still probably need to get some form of a mechanic or an auto electrician or something like that close to a mining machine at some point in time. So um, you can probably get to a point where you can remove a lot of the people from, from the hazardous areas, but you will need to still cater for specific um, circumstances, outliers, where you, you may need to be very careful with what you do. So. Um, 
yeah, still don't know really what the answer is, but those are my thoughts. Okay, another question from Hi Tom. He asked about the vision methodology. Um, he says, the time delay problem for breaking the vehicle, how do you overcome this problem? Uh, so I understand this question. But I, I hope I understand you. So, so yes. if, you, if you use a uh, vision met methodology, then there's a time delay um, in processing and that can have an effect on breaking the vehicle. Yes, um, th that is true. Um, so I'm not sure how to answer it, but uh, if I have to speculate, um, so we've not used uh, uh, vision sensors uh, ourselves for this uh, for the testing, but um, I think if we th look at the application, um, the speeds are for underground machines. We're typically looking at between 10 and 20 kilometers an hour uh, top speed. Um, for the big mining machines, we typically expect 40 to 50 kilometers an hour. Um, so that's much slower than highway speeds, um, which hopefully will give you a bit more processing time. Um, for, for your visual strategy. Um, once you actually decide to start slowing and stopping the machine, um, you typically, we've measured anything between below 200 milliseconds um, for, for reaction to more than one and a half seconds uh, before the machine starts slowing down. So um, the, the braking system um, that is used has a, a big influence, um, especially because you, Typically, I have to apply two braking strategies where you either apply a retarder. Some of these very big machines are electric drive. So um, uh, all of these things add to different um, machine delays from the point that you start applying the brakes or send the instruction for the machine to, to start braking. Another aspect here is because these machines are very old in many cases, you have a retrofitted brake-by-wire system that uh, introduces additional delays and so on. It's, it's not designed by the OEM. It, it might be a third party uh, retrofit. So um, all of this makes for uh, quite a quite a big challenge for any supplier of, of this technology. Any more questions from the audience? Maybe uh, before we wrap up, one last question from me and, and maybe just a short answer on, on that. Um, how do you think, how important do you think vehicle dynamics is in, 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 in this situation? Do we need to take into account the suspension and the steering and all these things on the vehicle? Um, Prof, yes, I think that's a, a, a good question and, and the answer is yes. Um, even though the dynamics, uh, it's pretty slow, um, the, the consequences of, of not controlling it properly are, are quite serious. As I said, the rollover propensity of, of these machines, is, especially the big ones, is, is very high. Um, so uh, you need to be very careful with what you do. You want to bring the machine to a controlled stop. So, um, so whatever action you do needs to take into account the vehicle dynamics. I see Andres in the in the chat has mentioned steering and so on as alternate options. Um, so if those options become available, it becomes even more important to to take this into account. Um, the varying payload, which changes your mass moment of inertia significantly, it moves your CG position around. All of this will affect the performance, and it it's going to change frequently because you let's say a whole cycle takes less than one hour. So you go from a fully laden vehicle um, to a fully empty vehicle, a change of more than 50% in, in the GVM uh, of the machine within an hour. Um, so understanding all of these things when you are acting um, and then especially additionally, when you are planning what to do, um, because you need to look so far ahead into the future because these machines respond so slowly, um, understanding how to, how the, or predicting where the machine will be um, very far into the future um, based on noisy sensor measurements, etc. Um, all of that is, is, is a very big challenge and, and vehicle dynamics and understanding vehicle dynamics is, that, that's the 
underlying fundamentals. It's the physical world that we, we need to understand. So the better that we can model these um, machines, um, this ranges from developing tire models for some of these very big machine, big wheels to uh, how do you measure the mass moment of inertia of a truck such as the one on the screen at the moment. Uh, I mean, that's, I think, experimentally near, near impossible. Um, so how do we estimate these things through parameter estimation and state estimation, as Robin has, has alluded to? All of these things build on the fundamentals of vehicle dynamics. So um, it's never been more important, at least not for, in my opinion, for the mining industry here in, in, in South Africa, uh, and hence our continued focus uh, on this. Um, we have another question in the chat, but before I pose that question to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you, after this video, have more uh, questions, you see Herman's email address on the screen. There's also a QR code, so please feel free to, to contact him. Uh, this video will also be available if you want to watch it later or uh, tell other people to watch it. So we have a question from Ray, uh, who says, are current industry solutions using machine learning approaches to sensor fusion, such as combining stereo vision or radar? Yes, uh, we have seen some some suppliers dabble in it. Um, there, there are some consequences, though, that you need to be very careful of. Um, because this is a safety system, um, you, you're getting to the realm where something like functional safety and so on uh, becomes quite important. And the moment that you are using artificial intelligence to, to train your models and, and so on, um, this becomes a very difficult uh, thing to prove from, from a, so, and, and functional safety is not really applicable there, yet you want that kind of behavior. So um, to answer your question shortly, yes, we have seen some suppliers dabble with it. We've not seen commercial products uh, really. Um, I think you, you're talking here about stereo vision. Um, my opinion is that it's while it may be very useful, um, the, the challenging lighting conditions uh, limits its application if you're using only that. So if you if you want to combine that with radar or lidar or other um, more modern technologies, then of course you will probably have to move towards some form of artificial intelligence and and, and so on. Um, but tread very very carefully um, to make sure that we don't have a system that successfully, you know, classifies a, a light vehicle um, today and then tomorrow it misses it because the vehicle is now suddenly a deep red because of the uh, the dust on the mine and now the color is, is wrong and you miss the detection. So, um, but yeah, that, that, that's probably part of the um, the developments we, we expect in the in the next few years or so is, is wider application of AI. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in the chat, uh, there is a, a link to the YouTube playlist for the other ISTVS digital event series uh, videos. This has been going on for uh, quite some time and there are a lot of really interesting uh, videos if you would like to watch them. So please follow that, uh, that link. Um, I see there is one question, one last question from Robin. Uh, are there any boundary conditions or state variables that you have found surprisingly sensitive or difficult to estimate apart from friction? Um, yes, good question. I think um, the the answer is yes, but it's for, for a strange reason. And, and that is that many of the machines actually have onboard sensors but they are hesitant to provide this information to the third party uh, supplier that has to actually slow and stop the machine. So something like the payload um, is, is absolutely crucial and, and many of the machines can actually measure it, but they don't want to provide that information to the supplier. So now what do you do? You, how do you actually uh, tap into that or how do you estimate that? Um, so so that, that I think is, is, is probably the first thing that springs to mind um, when, when I think of these, these options. As, as you mentioned, friction I think is, is absolutely critical. Um, but, but yeah, I think payload is, is, is the big one and then uh, steering angle. So um, again, to measure steering angle, uh, to go and retrofit that uh, robustly onto a mining machine that will withstand the test of time 
is, is very difficult. Um, what we are seeing is uh, suppliers are using IMUs and gyroscopes and magnetometers and so on to try and measure the, the, the yaw rate um, and then, then plan or predict the path that the machine will follow based on that um, with, with varied levels of success. So um, some of it that if you think of a passenger car is something that's very easy to measure becomes quite difficult when, you, when you're faced with these very big machines. Um, So, ladies and gentlemen, the challenge is out there. Lots of nice technical problems to solve for academia and practitioners and researchers working in the field of terrain vehicle systems. Um, so, this concludes uh, our event for today. Thank you very much, Harman, for your presentation. Um, please contact Harman if you need uh, any uh, more information.